All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, as promised, okay, next video, we're going to go ahead, we're going to focus on the shifter rebuild. Uh, our one from eBay did go ahead and appear on my doorstep today, so we're going to get a chance here. We're going to get a little bit of an unboxing event going on. We're going to go ahead, we're going to compare the quote-unquote functional shifter that is from an, uh, eBay with the shifter I have that is a, a little uh, bit in a state of disarray. And then from there, we're going to go ahead, we're going to work on rebuilding it. To kind of give you an idea, uh, there's a decent amount of parts on there that need to be rebuilt and refurbished. Uh, some of them need to actually go through and uh, be measured out and drawn and basically recreated. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do that via SolidWorks and I'm going to go and actually get you, give you an opportunity to see that. Uh, some of the parts just need a little bit of work. Uh, I know there's some rubber bushings that probably just need to be cleaned. I know there's some parts that need to be greased. Uh, but for the most part, this video is going to go through the whole process. And from there, we're hopefully going to have two working shifters. All right, so without further ado, let's get to it. All right, so I already took the liberty to actually go through and cut the top open. And so right away, uh, when I cut it open, I, I got packing peanuts. I can't stand packing peanuts. Oh, man. Um, let me go through and, ugh. See, this is why I hate packing peanuts. Like, I mean, you got to be kidding me, right? Ugh. Like, are you, is this serious? Like, is this real life right now? So, uh, give me a couple minutes to clean this out. Holy crap. Like, is this... So, right away, it does actually, let me be honest, it does feel like a pretty good shifter. Um, the one, I don't know how it's functional, considering in this case, you know, I've, I've got two very random wires just strewn about. I mean, this is a slip-on connector that is currently coming off. Looks like that's fourth gear. So, also... This is a Molex connector. It's a modified Molex connector, um, but it's a, it's a Molex connector nonetheless. So this is not necessarily fully OE. This is the one that came in. And so this little six pin connector, uh, which is very, in this case, similar, uh, very similar to almost like a six pin uh, PCI Express power connector, it's not exactly the same. This one, 100%, is nowhere near as tight as that one. First and foremost, so this, this right here, is what's left of basically the dust. Uh, what I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call the, the, uh, the dust protector, it's on the top of the shifter. So you can kind of see that's, that's from the shifter that, I, that it came with the system. Uh, that's got to be rebuilt. I don't necessarily know how the seller thought this thing was functional. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to run a continuity test, see exactly what I get as I go through gears, um, and then we'll go from there. So I'm going to break out my multimeter, put it on continuity mode, so we can get a nice uh, audible okay. Uh, so let's Number one, put this in what I'm going to assume is fourth gear. I mean, this switch doesn't even give me anything. Okay. All right, so eBay shifter. We're going to go ahead. We're going to pull this thing off. This is number one. Let's go back to here. So... In this case, between the two shifters, um, so as I kind of go through this, so in between the two shifters, there's definitely some busted parts. I showed you in this case the dust collector. Uh, we're going to work on that in a second. This piece that holds the switch together, um, this is broken on the shifter I got. So this is going to be a challenge because this is super thin metal. All right, so from there, let's test another switch. So flip this around. 
So in this case, what do we say? Down here was fourth. No, that was fourth. So third. This would be first. All right, so first gear. I mean, first gear's off too. I mean, I, I just, how is this functional, dude? So, switch is good though. I mean, the interesting part about this, so like, I'm using a Phillips screw to pull that out, and then there's a flathead here to hold this other one in. Like, I don't necessarily get that. This looks to be a non OE switch. Nope, never mind. It's a cherry switch. I can't imagine what this cost in the 90s. Um, yeah, so there's that. Okay, and then. Interesting. So then this tells it we're in second, I think. I mean, I don't necessarily know what's the front, what's the back right now. I guess once we get in the machine and it works, I guess. I, I, guess. I, it, I mean, we've only got three switches. So what, it's really neat the, what, the fact that it only uses three switches. But so I'm looking at this, and so. I'll go ahead and I'll zoom in this in a second. But so when you're watching this, so first, and so in this case, the switch, this switch is actuated. So you've got to have two switches to then get the second. So in this case, this is this is third. I'm in third right now. So sorry, that would be second. So this is second, first. And they're, it, it's actuated the entire time. But so when you go in the second like this, or in this case, sorry, first, first gets two switches, second gets, in this case, only one. And then when I go into third, third would get no switches. And then fourth gets another switch. Two switches are on for first, one is on for second, none are on for third, and then a separate switch is on for fourth. This uses, well, this is interesting because this uses smaller screws. So I need to use precision screws to get this one out. Now, I will say, at least with this switch, it's supported by the actual, what looks to be, I mean, it's either painted, it's definitely painted, I think. Regardless, it's, it's supported by the frame. Pulling this off, we're good. So. Got three good switches. I didn't test this one. I should probably do that. So I got a good switch. I got all three good switches. All three switches are good. Um, so at least you're talking, I can reuse this. I just don't know what to do with this harness. I mean, there's a lot of strangeness. And then this. This looks like it's plugged in to the adapter I have for the non-OE shifter. So I don't really want to have to use that. I'd rather have, in this case, a universal adapter. So i got to see if I can go ahead and reverse engineer the second one, or the original one that came with my unit, into a connector that I can use. And maybe I, maybe I redo OE connectors. I don't really want to, unless I can find some originals. But maybe I, I, I go ahead and I use connectors in this case, that I can source, and then go from there. So, all right, well, this is done. So I'm gonna put this over here, and let's talk about like nitty gritty stuff. Um, so, this is actually in pretty solid shape. Now, it's got rubber, and it's got these hard sliders that are bearings. At least it feels like there's bearings. So it's nice that I have these. So these rubber, these rubber stoppers, uh, what they're used for is basically bumpers, and they're they are in a little bit. They're a little worn where the shifter goes into them, so you can kind of hear it. 
um, but it's not going to affect them. But so what's nice is that this is a one style piece. So what I can do is, is I can actually remodel this, make sure that my measurements are right, just 3D print a test model, throw it in place, does it fit great? And then what I can do is I can CNC route new ones. Uh, I don't necessarily know if you can buy parts for these anymore. And in fact, I'm pretty sure you can't because someone said, hey, like it's hard to come by parts uh, on one of my Reddit posts. But if I can go ahead and I can make my own parts, then we're good to go. I'm going to go ahead and pull this one out because it's missing a fastener. So I'll shift this down and then we'll go through and we'll measure it out. So. has some flex to it but I don't know. it's it's a bumper you know uh what is it golden eye use a bumper that's what it's for i mean it's meant to hit things so all right so let's talk how i'm going to attack this you probably noticed right away in my frame is my composition book and i was using it uh to take notes actually on the chassis uh, it's a composition book that's based off graph paper so it's great for notes but it's also great for pictures so what I'll do is I'll go through, you notice I've got the rubber bumper here in my hand, is I'll, you know, basically quickly sketch out a drawing and I'll start to measure it. Uh, from there I'll go ahead and I'll recreate it in SOLIDWORKS. Now, typically when I do this, I'll go through and I'll double check my measurements once or twice once I've done my drawing. And then from there I'll recreate SOLIDWORKS and then I'll also go ahead and 3D print out a prototype. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll show you that whole process here in a little bit. So the 3D printed part fits, then from there, uh, I'll go ahead, I'll source some Delrin on the internet, and I'll use a CNC router to cut my final piece. I'll most likely end up cutting, what do you figure, if I don't, this, this I won't replace, I'll reuse these, I pro, at least that's what I say, but the other one, I know they're in pieces, so I have to recreate them. So I'll probably end up printing like four or six, just my initial run, see how they fit, and then go from there. Uh, if you wonder exactly, you know, how do you measure this out? You can use a typical ruler, and typically um, I go through and I use the metric system just because it gives you a little bit of preciser measurement. All right. I also have, in this case, a digital caliper, and this does make it very easy to find precise measurements. So uh, let me go run through this real quick. Yes, I use a pen because scratch marks make me feel good. I don't know. All right, so in this scenario, using the composition book, especially the ones that are based off graph paper, really do make things easier. So if you've got straight lines, you can use the graph to actually go ahead and use it as a measuring tool. Uh, in this case, really just use it more of a guide. And you can kind of see my process here as I go through and I use basically a mix of the digital caliper along with just a basic ruler. Uh, you're probably better off if you have an engineering scale. But in this case, I didn't have one lying around, so I just used a wooden ruler, which is still great, especially used in, uh, in conjunction with the digital caliper itself. Now, again, like I said, there is no need to go out there and buy a really expensive digital caliper, or even a dial caliper, unless you're really doing some very precise measurements. For me, this is perfect. Um, it gives me pretty much what I want. As far as tolerance is concerned, I think it's point. I think it's 0.1 millimeters plus or minus if I remember correctly when I bought it. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but so it does use, it's very useful for the purpose I have. Um, in this case, you can see uh, I've gone through, notice my circles, they're kind of centered out in the picture, although I did find out that they are centered on the edge of the bumper. And the only reason I found this out is that the eBay shifter actually came with some really good uh, bumpers for me to go ahead and measure. If I had to use the shifter that came with the unit that I purchased, it would have been a lot tougher. Although to be honest, when you go through and you 3D, you can use a 3D printer to prototype things, it does make things a whole lot easier. Um, now I do go ahead, you can see I'm messing around with the bushings that go, uh, that go inside, basically to go ahead and stop the screw from uh, actually crushing the rubber. Because I'm using uh, 
ace it's all it's it's not going to matter so i can in this case use just a fender washer not even a fender washer regular washer along with a lock washer to go ahead and get the pressure i need on that ace it's all um to replace the plastic and actually get it uh, mounted into place um overall what you're going to see in, in another video is me uh going through and 3D printing it, test fitting it, and then going and CNC routing it uh, with the Ace at all, at least once it shows up. Um, but anyway, so that's the whole process. All right, so next next part is going to be the dust collector. You can get a little bit of a better picture here, but so I'm going to go ahead and work on this drawing. I'll give you a, a nicer picture to look at, but this thing is toast, shredded, two pieces. There's actually three or four other pieces that go along in the center that I just don't even, I think I trashed them. But so recreating this is probably not going to be too complicated the hardest part is going to be machining it the reason why this is going to be so hard to machine is because the thickness of the piece or in this case the lack of thickness uh, measured out with digital caliper we got approximately 1.5 millimeters which for those of you that need something standard to compare it to uh, it's less than a sixteenth of an inch now I did luck out and found some thin material. Uh, it is Delrin based. It actually has a texture top to it, which I thought was more reminiscent of most shifters um, in this era of arcade racers. But regardless, it's actually one sixteenth on the dot. Um, it was relatively cheap. It's actually pretty good quality. It did show up today um, in the process of editing this video. Uh, I am worried about the 16th of an inch versus the 1.5 uh, millimeters, but we should be good and it should fit. Uh, the thing that worries me the most is machining it. Uh, I have actually CNC routed Plexi before. I did that for the uh, marquee on my RetroPie based bar top arcade without issue, but Delrin is going to be a little different. So we'll find out in this whole process if Delrin is easy, easily machinable as what everybody says. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, before I go any further, uh, pro tip. There is red Loctite everywhere in this thing. And I get it. These were jammed, jammed around all day in the arcade. Uh, I talked about I didn't think this thing saw a really rough life, and I don't think it did. And I think there was a hobbyist that worked on this, and things like this tell me I was, I'm right. Red Loctite should be used, in this case, in very high heat, uh, or very vibration uh, specific applications. This is not vibration. Not when we talk extreme vibration. And so the fact that it is everywhere and it's spilling out of the bolts and the screw, why? You use a little bit and as you thread it contacts all the threads. Too much of it, it doesn't cure and it serves no purpose. Okay, and I, I get it. That's worst case scenario, and it does something. You're right. But let's be real here. So when I rebuild this, I'm using blue Loctite, and I'm using very little of it. And I'll show you that, because uh, this is a mess, an absolute mess. It's just aggravating. I, I, I had a screw strip, luckily, in this case. I have, and this is, my, my dad picked this up. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll tell you more about this. But so this isn't a Phillips bit. It's like JIS, which stands for Japanese, Japanese Industry Standard, which is ironic because the whole thing's Japanese. I didn't plan that. But so it's a Phillips bit. It's not. It's a little bit different. But the best part is on the tip, it's got teeth. You push this thing in, and it gets a grip. And so even with this, I stripped one of these screws because of the Loctite. And then I also got it all over my hands, and I'm getting annoyed. You know, I, I get why, like, there's grounds on this thing. And so I think that that makes sense. But what's interesting is that doesn't have one. All right, so let's talk about what the ground's for. So you see this. Uh, this ground is here so that this is a metallic shifter. You don't want, at, you don't want like just all of a sudden some random current floating around like and zapping people. So the ground makes sense. So this is actually here, but it's, it's, it's in a, a bit of a, state of duress so it's actually got two pieces it grounds the actual frame itself it also grounds the actual shifter assembly which is really neat it's really actually a good idea I will go ahead and rebuild this I will also figure out 
connector wise, if I've got another one of these lying around somewhere so I know I can use the OE connector. Um, so yeah, pretty neat. What happens when you tighten all these? So why don't you put red Loctite in this? That makes sense, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. That's nice. So first and second are good. Third. So th second. First. Yeah, that's... So... This bumper is there, good, is good. This one's not. So, all right, so again, like, you go first is solid. Now, granted, you're going to hear the without a bumper. So, but this is super tight. But you go third and fourth where it gets jammed the most because people are power shifting. This is definitely, this needs work. So, this rubber on the inside of here is going to have to be replaced. So I got to go get a socket, 10 millimeter socket. Um, I'm going to pull this apart, see what's inside there, because something else has got to be replaced. See inside all it is, okay, is you've got, and it looks like whether this has been replaced or broken, I'm not sure, but so it's got just rubber here that acts as bumpers again. And this is actually a piece of Delrin. This has been pulled apart at some point because there should be a slip ring on here holding that in place that's no longer there. So this is apparently a non-OE fix. But uh, let's go ahead, let's pull this whole thing off. This Delrin piece looks like it's in really good shape. So that's good to know. So looking at this, man, yeah, this has definitely been all sorts of just no idea. Hard hard rubber, hard plastic. Like I might switch it to Delrin. Alright, so what I'm gonna do guys, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna I'll take a actually fits in that s spot really nicely, surprisingly. Um. Now, it might be hard to actually see this in the video, but the condition of these rubber bushings that act as those upper bumpers are, is actually pretty poor. The one is in two pieces, and the other is in three, and unfortunately the one that's in better condition is the one that's in three pieces. Uh, it's going to be difficult to ascertain that their shape and their size accurately, so it's my best guess that this is going to take a couple rounds of prototyping, meaning my initial measurements I have here, I'll go ahead and 3D print, test their size, make adjustments to go from there. And accuracy is important in this case uh, because if we've got basically too big of a piece, there won't be enough play, and getting this thing in the gear is going to be difficult, if not impossible. And if we've got the dimensions too small, there's going to be too much play, just like a worn part, and what we're going to get then is that mashing of metal parts, which is ultimately going to go ahead and slowly uh, rattle this thing to pieces. All right, so at this point, I have both shifters to the point they're disassembled where I feel like I have a good idea of what needs to be done. I'm not going to talk about cosmetics right now. What I'm going to talk about is just making these physically, okay, perfect or as perfect as I can. Um, both shifters, in this case, the bottom end where you've got those rubber bushings along with that Delrin basically uh, like outside piece that goes along with the bearings, I feel very good about. So I'm going to let them go. Um, on the original shifter, we talked about in this case, the bumper, okay, for the X-axis, what we called, that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, I'll probably end up rebuilding that, also keeping a spare alongside for the eBay shifter, but that was pretty good. Uh, both of them, 
definitely have some issues when it comes to, in this case, the bumpers on the bottom. So I do have my drawing. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and recreate that, along with, in this case, the dust cover. Uh, but regardless, I feel pretty good as long as I can get some of these pieces recreated. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to hop over to SolidWorks, and we're going to start working on that process. And then at that point, we'll go through, we'll get some prototypes 3D printed, see where we're at fit-wise, make adjustments where we have to, and then go from there. All right, so I went ahead and I, I cut the video a little bit short. Uh, I did want to go ahead and show you kind of the whole process we went through to go and basically recreate parts three-dimensionally in SolidWorks. And unfortunately, that video didn't necessarily work out. I did live stream the process. It only took me about 20 minutes, like, real time. Uh, but the audio and the video quality really wasn't up to snuff. Not that the video quality that I have at this point is super great, but it just wasn't there. Um, on top of it, the video I took of myself, uh, there was a lot of washed out color. You really just kind of saw the back of my bald head. And at one point, my wife came in and kind of interrupted everything. Uh, so I, I kind of pulled that out. I figured the video was long enough as it was. I did get all the parts recreated, and I did get a chance to actually go and 3D print uh, the dust cover. Um, or at least a prototype of the dust cover. And so thickness-wise, compared to the uh, material that showed up from Amazon, it's actually a little bit thicker because I didn't use the Ultimaker to go ahead and print it. I used something else. Uh, and it act this fits. So the material that's more along the lines of the 1.5 millimeters that I measured out earlier is actually more accurate and going to actually give us a better fit. So I'm really excited to go through and CNC route that. I am going to go ahead and I'm going to show you the process in another video, uh, 3D printing everything, going through test fits, seeing how everything looks, making adjustments where I need to, and then going from there. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. Uh, feel, the, feel free to go ahead and like and subscribe if you liked what you see. Please go ahead and share if you know people are interested in making stuff, breaking stuff, tinkering, whatever you want to call this. I like to call it winging engineering myself. Uh, but anyone that you know might enjoy this, go ahead. Send them my link. Uh, it is now youtube.com slash Mr. Bendog. Uh, I did get a custom link because you guys got me 100 subs. I'd love to see some more. Uh, again, thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you next time.